Thank you, David. Yeah. That bring back, brings back a, a memory of an eight-track tape that my mom had of Elvis Presley singing so, sp old spirituals, and that was on it. And it's positive. That's a good memory. Oh, you, you have it in your car. Okay. Eight-track tape. That was great. Thank you. And welcome to all. Welcome those of you who are here. Welcome to our online friends as we gather together to worship God, but also to receive from God um, the blessings um, and the joy of God's love. I'm going to highlight one thing from our bulletin today. There are a number of announcements in there, and that is as we grieve the past, passing of Franz Stefan, uh, you'll see there, there's a memorial service scheduled there for her on September 1st. Uh, Fran took such great care of the landscaping around the church, and we're wondering you know, now how do we take care of it, um, and so we're thinking of an idea of having people adopt a certain section of the landscaping around. So if that's something that you would like to do, you, would, um, you think you'd like to do, write a note, contact the church office, give me a note, or just tell me, and then we'll kind of coordinate um, the care of the landscaping around the church that Fran took such great care of over the years. It's so beautiful. As we enter into worship today, we're continuing our series on uh, the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about kindness today, and whenever we talk about kindness on our end of things, we have to be reminded that God is kind and that God's heart is good to us, and that's what brings us to worship today. So with that in mind, let's join together in our responsive call to worship. The invitation is given to every person by Jesus Christ. Come to me. Follow me. We come to this place and to this time at the invitation of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, we praise our God and celebrate God's goodness. In the midst of a world that can sometimes be cruel, we proclaim the God of compassion. Where there is despair that threatens to swallow up lives and communities, we proclaim the God of hope. In the midst of indifference and apathy, we proclaim the God of love. Come, let us worship together and praise our Savior Jesus Christ, who calls us to follow him into the world and proclaim God's loving kindness. Let's stand together and sing when morning gilds the skies. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kurt, and uh, I'll be leading you in the prayer of praise. It's a responsive prayer, so please read the bold type. God's faithful love and endures forever and ever. Because of God's everlasting goodness, 
we offer God our thanks and praise. God's faithful love endures forever and ever. Because of God's care and concern for humanity, we offer God our thanks and praise. God's faithful love endures forever and ever. Because of God's transforming grace, we affirm as a community of faith our trust in God, and we offer God our thanks and praise. You may stay seated for the responsive um, song. Come to God in prayer again in a prayer of confession and reflection and just a reminder again that confession is not just all the bad things. Confession is just who we are. We just bring ourselves honestly to God with whatever is on our hearts and minds today. So with that in mind, let us pray. God of Shalom, we have built up walls to protect ourselves from those we consider as enemies. But those walls also shut us off from receiving your love. Break down those walls. Help us to see that the way to your heart is through the reconciliation of our own hearts with those with whom we differ. Bless them and us that we may come to grow in love for each other and for you. Through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Let's take a moment for our own personal prayers and reflection.
Amen. Hear these words of assurance from David, who says, I am still confident of this. We will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Friends, know the goodness of God who forgives, restores, and supplies all of our needs. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Be at peace, love the Lord your God, and serve your neighbor. Thanks be to God. Now let's take a moment to stand and pass the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of the Lord be with those of you at home. Let's pass the peace. morning again. This morning the first scripture uh, from Galatians was from the letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians. Galatia, I did a little research, is in Asia Minor. It's what we now kind of, I would guess, is Turkey um, for the most part. And um, 
Paul wrote this letter. He'd been to Galatia twice in his travels, and he wrote this letter out of concern for what he thought the church was succumbing to legalism again. And uh, so the message kind of can speak to us today. So from chapter 6, verses 7 through uh, 10. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for, all the, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Kurt. That passage occurs uh, shortly after the list of the, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and we're continuing our series on the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and we've looked at so far love, joy, peace, and patience. And so next are kindness and goodness. And I'm going to take those together uh, because they overlap quite a bit. And we'll hear both words and concepts uh, in this next teaching from Jesus, just as we heard um, in Galatians. So this is Luke 6, 27 to 36. Jesus says, I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For, those, for even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> After a hard teaching, when we say this is the word of the Lord, always, thanks be to God, nah, really? That's a tough one. But there's a lot of, been a lot of talk about kindness these past few years, about being kind and expressing kindness, and for good reason. We see it on signs, on billboards, on cars, bumper stickers. I even have a mug with a picture of a bee on it, and underneath it, it says kind. Get it? Be kind. A little show and tell this morning. <laughs> now, on the surface, kindness and goodness seem simple and straightforward, maybe even boring, perhaps in some people's minds, even weak. You know, be kind, do good. At the very least, don't be a jerk. But kindness and goodness aren't boring at all, and they aren't weak at all. Kindness and goodness actually require great strength because... The biblical word here for kindness, for starters, krustos in the Greek, is defined as love towards those who are unkind. Or as we heard in our reading, love shown to enemies, uh, to the ungrateful. Jesus says that God is even kind to the wicked. And to that I say, good for you, God. <laughs> you go for it. But then I reread this teaching and take it in and realize that Jesus suggests that he wants us to be kind in the same way and do good to difficult people in the same way. Given this teaching and others like it, we might say that kindness and goodness are expressions of love toward those who don't deserve it, or at least we believe they don't deserve it. 
kindness towards those who deserve it or whom we already love, Jesus says, is not really kindness. That's basic human instincts at work. You know, we naturally love our family, uh, those family members we get along with at least. We naturally love our friends. We naturally love those who are good to us. And as we heard in our reading from Luke, Jesus says if we love those who love us or do good to those who are good to us, kind of no big deal. That's easy. Everybody does it. Kindness, rather, a godlike kindness, is love expressed towards those who don't deserve it, yet who need it. That's what kindness is. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans 2.4. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Not it's guilt tripping that leads people to repentance or a lecture from God that leads people to repentance, but kindness, which means kindness isn't showed exclusively to people who deserve it, but to those who need it. Even our commonly used phrase, kill them with kindness, assumes that the person we're extending kindness to is someone we'd like to, well, kill. <laughs> we're just doing it with kindness. Now, parenthetically, kindness, as it appears in the Bible, almost always follows patience. It follows patience in our fruit of the spirit list. It follows patience in the list of attributes of love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind, right? And in 2 Timothy 2, where Paul is describing leadership in the church, he says, a leader must not be quarrelsome, but patient and kind to everyone. Which is why one commentator defined uh, Christos, kindness, as the ability to act for the welfare of those who are taxing our patience. So there's something about kindness that flows from patience. When we can calm ourselves down and slow ourselves down and take time to think clearly and not just react. You know, when we can be long-tempered, remember, and exercise patience, we will be more apt to act with kindness toward people we have a difficult time loving. Now, giving this understanding of kindness, then, as love expressed to the undeserving or for those who are difficult for us to love, as a fruit of the Spirit, kindness is something that we need to pray for help with, because it is something that probably doesn't come naturally to us. Therefore, it must be a fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and not just something we try to muster up enough willpower to do because we're supposed to. We can't simply muster up that strength on our own. We need to pray for it, remembering that everything Jesus teaches us to do, he also supplies the strength to carry out. And what he's asking us to do in loving enemies isn't easy to do, at least not right away. But it's something that as we walk with Jesus and learn from Jesus and as we practice it, kindness becomes maybe a little bit more reflexive over time because of the Spirit of Christ at work in us, building our inner reservoir of goodness. Last year, I picked up a book titled, and I just, I saw the title, and I thought, I need to buy this book. And it's titled, The War for Kindness. Put that on the show and tell table here. <laughs> and it's kind of ironic that the author uses the word war in a book about kindness, but I'm sure his publisher wanted a, this excellent book to grab our attention. And mission accomplished, it got my attention. The title also suggests that we're in a battle for the soul of our society. And what sets this book apart from others that encourages, other books can encourage kindness maybe simply as a moral imperative or a spiritual imperative. What sets this book apart is that the author, Jamil Zaki, has research and scientific data that prove that kindness and goodness can rewire people's brains that empathy can be learned, and that kindness can change the culture of organizations and communities. He tells stories of people fighting for kindness in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. For example, a former neo-Nazi now working to extract people from hate groups. Former inmates discussing novels with the judge who sentenced them. Washington state police officers changing their culture to decrease violence among their ranks and hospital nurses working together to find ways to increase empathy, not just with uh, patients and families, but with a core of nurses so that they don't burn out. It's a very hopeful take on kindness based on research and data. 
And it won't surprise us to learn that this effort to build kindness and goodness and empathy into lives and into systems comes from spiritual and religious principles. We heard it in our readings this morning from Galatians and from Luke. And just about every major religion in the world has kindness as a foundational practice. Remember what the Dalai Lama said a few years ago, kindness is my religion. And for many in our society, kindness is their religion too. We just need more people to be religious in this way, to create positive momentum and change. Just for fun, one uh, young author of children's books, uh, Alicia Ortego, is helping kids get on board with kindness. She published a book, a children's book, called Kindness is My Superpower. And the point is, if we don't, if we don't teach children about this, they'll pick it up uh, from other, pick up other things from other places. This past week, I, I got a chuckle reading um, a Catholic priest whose spiritual reflections have blessed me um, over the years. And in telling the story of his childhood years, he said, when I was growing up as a Catholic boy in Kansas, we viewed all Protestants as heretics who were going to hell. But then I met a few nice Methodists, and I found out that they thought I was going to hell too. We had a good laugh, and they became friends, learned from each other, and helped each other change and grow. And that's what kindness will do. Remember again, Romans 2.4, it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Or even put the word change in there that leads to change. It's not the judgment of God that leads to repentance or the punishment of God that leads to repentance, but the kindness of God. Kindness changes people. So we don't kill people with kindness. We bless them with kindness. We honor them. We offer them the possibility of being changed and transformed, just like we hopefully have been changed and transformed by kindness. Jesus says in a fairly startling statement, if you think about it, that God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And somehow, with God's help, we are to learn to imitate that behavior, because that's how people can be changed. Again, Jesus teaches us to show kindness to the ungrateful and the wicked, not because he approves of their behavior and he wants us to, but because it provides an opportunity for them to experience God's love, just like we have experienced God's love and for them to be changed, as we have been changed by God's love. It reveals the Father's heart and becomes a witness, whether or not they respond positively to it. How they respond is not our main concern. We don't control outcomes. In other words, we don't control people. Our job is to be kind and gracious with God's help and let God settle the outcome and do the transforming work. But it's really the only way to provide the opportunity for someone to be changed and to make the world a better place. Now, when we talk about loving enemies and doing good to those who don't deserve it, the question will inevitably arise, who's my enemy? And that's a really good question. It seems pretty clear from the scripture that when Jesus talks about loving an enemy and showing kindness to the difficult ones in our lives, He assumes that it's someone that we have human contact with, or have the ability to have contact with. Yes, there are enemies of the state around the world. Perhaps you feel like a certain politician or elected official is an enemy. But for the sake of initiating kindness and doing it to someone who tests our patience, we're talking about someone that we have contact with, or have the ability to have contact with. And it needs to be said Sometimes that someone we believe is an enemy isn't really an enemy at all. Our imaginations make them into an enemy because we make all kinds of assumptions without interacting with them. And that's another reason why initiating kindness is so important and not labeling people. Because when we can take the time to interact with someone who taxes our patience, we may discover that they aren't as horrible as we thought they were. Or maybe they are that horrible. Love them anyway. Do good. Be kind. I'd like to remind us of a story um, that came out of the Charlottesville riots. Uh, Hard to believe that that was six years ago. And it's a story of an African-American woman who's a documentary journalist and a filmmaker uh, named Dia Khan, 
who, while she was there, uh, carried some water bottles with her to give to people while she was doing her documentary work. Um, it was hot in Charlottesville, and she wanted to show support uh, in a simple way by giving out water to people who needed it. During the protest, she saw a man named Ken Parker, who was a white nationalist and a grand dragon of the KKK. And she saw that he was languishing from heat exhaustion, and she gave him a bottle of water and stayed with him and talked with him until he felt better and he, and he could receive medical attention. Now that small act of kindness began a transformation. Her kindness tweaked his mind and his heart. And the two of them began a conversation and, and talked over the months. And at the same time that the two of them were talking, Ken Parker got to know a neighbor named William McKinnon, who unbeknownst to him was the pastor of an African-American church. And they developed a relationship, and Ken Parker noticed that, quote, something was different about him. Now, long story short, Ken Parker renounced his affiliation with the KKK and white nationalism and now worships at McKinnon's church. A former white nationalist worshiping at an almost all-black church all because of one simple act of kindness toward him by an African-American journalist. Ken Parker said about Dia Khan, she was completely respectful of me the whole time. And so that kind of got me thinking, she's a really nice lady. Just because she's got darker skin and has different beliefs than I do, why am I hating all these people? Now, this story went public, uh, and I was able to read it, and I'm able to share it with you because it was circulated in the media in several places. But think of the hundreds, maybe even thousands, of acts of kindness and of doing good that aren't written about and aren't circulated in the media, but take place every day. And think of how many acts of kindness are done, and the person who performs the good never finds out what effect their kindness had on someone. I mean, I can think of people over the course of my life who showed kindness to me, who, who never saw me again, and I never saw them again, and they'll never know how much their kindness affected me. This is why, as the Apostle Paul says in the reading from Galatians, let us not grow weary in doing what is right. And as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, because we never know how one small act of kindness can change someone. So let's sing about this in the gift of love. It's based on 1 Corinthians uh, 13. Let's stand together and sing. be seated. Uh, this morning's prayer is based on a great line from Psalm 75, verse 3, 
which says, When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who hold its pillars steady. This God speaking. Isn't that a great line? When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who hold its pillars steady. And so the, the prayer is based on that. So let's pray together, and there will be a moment to lift up persons or situations that you would like to pray for out loud or um, silently. We look to you, gracious God, and thank you that you are the one who steadies the world and steadies us, often in ways that are hidden from human sight. So we trust in your goodness and kindness and your strength, even when things look shaky and like they're falling apart. You steady the world and you steady us. We pray that you would steady nations that are in conflict with each other, and nations that have internal conflicts, including ours. Bring peace, and be the peace that helps people think and act clearly and in ways that help all people thrive. May the kindness of your heart be known as it is expressed through your people, scattered as salt and light through the world and through our communities. Steady the people of Hawaii, specifically in Lahaina, following devastating wildfires. Thank you for rescue workers, volunteers, and people of goodwill who are providing shelter and basic necessities to those who have been displaced. And we pray for comfort for those who have, been, who have experienced devastating loss. As you study the world, we pray that you would be a steadying presence in the minds of heart and hearts of those who feel the burdens of life because of external circumstances or internal struggles. For those struggling with mental distress, anxiety, and loss, we pray for the steadiness of your comfort and strength. We continue to pray for Fran Steffen's family and friends following her sudden passing. We pray your healing and steadiness for Arlene in recovery from her stroke, for Jill in recovery from surgery. And now hear us as we pray for those persons and situations that are on our hearts to pray for this morning. Again, loving God, please steady the pillars of our lives, of our society, and of the world. Strengthen our hearts with the knowledge of your love and presence with us day by day. And now hear us as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song, I'm going to live so God can use me.
Got it all the keys on that song. That's fantastic. <laughs> Friends, now go in peace, and as you go, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you, that you might live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love, now and forevermore. And all of God's beloved said, Amen. Amen.